Hey everybody, good evening. Welcome to Book of Oz class part two. Uh, I'll come again. Book of Oz Tales part two, class five. Uh, and we're going to talk about the fall of Gondolin today. Um, first, uh, uh, a couple quick announcements. Um, one, again, I mentioned this last week, but uh, the summer classes for Mythgard are opening soon. Uh, I mentioned before last week we're having uh, uh, Amy Sturgis's uh, class on Lovecraft and uh, my class on Tolkien's poetry. Uh, so those classes are going to be opening up for enrollment. Um, should be within this next week, I hope, uh, between now and the next class. So uh, that's what we're that's what we're shooting for. Um, so I'm pretty excited about that. Um, we have. Uh, I, I also wanted to mention before I get started. I just heard a rumor. Tom Hillman sent this rumor to me about uh, that the BBC is currently working on a new uh, f uh, film version of Watership Down. That's, that's, that's the rumor. I don't know if I trust the rumor that much because the story that was telling this, you know, that was transmitting this rumor um, made some egregious and, and ridiculous mistakes. <laughs> like, for instance, they listed Thumper <laughs> among the rabbits in Watership Down. Like, seriously. Um, so, Gerald, uh, no, it's not a live-action Watership Down. They're not going to have highly trained rabbits. Uh, they're talking about a, uh, a, a, a CGI Watership Down. Um, I, we'll uh, see how that goes um so i don't know i don't know anyone who thinks that thumper is in watership down i'm not 100 percent sure is really on top of this story i mean i was gonna laugh at the fact that they said that fiverr was the hero of the story um and then you know but then like the thumper business sort of throws that out <laughs> completely out the window but anyhow um so we'll see uh, uh but if it does happen you know we should definitely we should we should definitely yeah, Tom Hillman says with uh, wound ward is probably a Sith Lord yeah probably anyway so if this does happen you know we'll definitely we'll definitely have to have a watership down class reunion event uh, uh, for that no question but uh, but we'll see we'll see I'm uh, I, I'm gonna remain skeptical on several levels I think anyhow so uh, <laughs> just wanted to, just wanted to sort of spread that rumor before we get going um, so Gondolin tonight. Now, I mentioned last time that there were some other things that I wanted to talk about. In particular, I've been pushing back now for two weeks, talking about uh, uh, dragon stuff, the, those those really interesting and tantalizing passages uh, in the tale of Tuor about the nature of dragons and who they are and how they work. And I think looking at these sort of this this early version um, of Tolkien's conception of dragons, dragons are really puzzling, especially in the published Silmarillion. They're not really well explained. Um, it's not really... I mean, I, I get ask this question a lot, like, what are dragons and how do they work? I'm never really quite sure how to answer it based on the published Silmarillion. Um, uh, you know, are they are they a kind of? Uh, I mean, are they are they Maya? Are they? I mean, how? What are they, and how do they work? Do they have souls, Michael? Exactly. Good question. I don't know. Um, but we get a very different thing here in these earlier versions, and so I think it'll be really interesting to kind of bring that. Not that that answers the question sort of definitively, but um, but anyway, it, it, it will be sort of an interesting point. But having pushed it off for two weeks already, I'm going to push it off one more time. Um, because uh, what I'm planning to do, next week we're going to look at the actual attack uh, on Gondolin. And when we do look at the uh, at the assault, you know, Melko's assault uh, on, on Gondolin, I want to do a, a sort of a feature view of each of all three of the major components of Melko's army. That is, I want to look at dragons, and I want to look at goblins slash orcs, and I want to look at balrogs, um, based on what we see of them in this story. So, um, yeah, and Karita, we're definitely going to talk about the mechanized dragons next week. So that's, that's I'm sorry, all of this I'm going to save till next week. So I decided I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna continue to defer the Glorin stuff um, and the nature of dragon business, and we'll con we'll consider it in the context of the stuff that we look at uh, um, next week. So. Anyway, just wanted to explain. I don't want you to worry that I've forgotten about it. I keep promising we're going to talk about this, and and we we, we will. We totally, really will. Um, but uh, next week, next week. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Brianna, you know, I, I, 
not a dragon, an, an image of a dragon, a Balrog riding a dragon into battle, is uh, would be spectacular. Even better would be a hundred Balrogs riding on a dragon into battle, right? I mean, that's got to be way better, right? Uh, so <laughs> anyway, um, uh, that would be a really cool image. Um, really. Okay, no, I'm not gonna. I'm, I'm not gonna get sucked into talking about the battle stuff. Next time, we'll do that. Next time, plenty of time. Next time, uh, to do uh, to do the the discussion of dragons and Balrogs and all that stuff. We're gonna save that stuff. Today, we're gonna talk about the beginning of the Gondolin story, and in particular, what I want to be looking at is the context of the Gondolin story, um, because what it seems that we are getting here is something that is quite near. The this phrase is so huge that I like instinctively pause before actually letting it fly. Something near the very beginning of Tolkien's imaginations about Middle Earth. I mean, this is we're 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 coming back in the story of the fall of Gondolin to just about the beginning, just about square one of the Middle Earth stories. If you want to find one place where Middle-earth begins, this story is it, really. Um, we don't have... I mean, there are other there's snatches and fragments and images and concepts and things, but for stories, this is pretty much it. This story um, seems genuinely to predate the Book of Lost Tales. Um, in fact, the three stories that we've read so far in this book are presented... They're, they're, ordered in this book in reverse order of their composition sequence, right? We've already looked at how the, the, the Turin story is written before the Baron and Luthien story, and Christopher Tolkien, of course, points out how you know many of the details in the Baron and Luthien story rely upon uh, the Turin story, and you can tell by the, the way he changes names and stuff that that, that dating is pretty confident. Um, so, that is what we get is the Turin story, which possibly predates, or at least elements of concepts of it might predate uh, the Book of Lost Tales concept, and then it gets reworked for the Lost Tales. The Baron and Luthien story comes out of the, the Book of Lost Tales time, right? While he's compiling these stories, he seems to write the Baron and Luthien story at that time, while he's doing, you know, so it's composed for the Book of Lost Tales. The, the, the story of Gondolin, of Tour and the Fall of Gondolin, is seems to be completely predating the Book of Lost Tales, um, and I think that there's lots of internal evidence for this. In it, you know, b besides the stuff that Christopher Tolkien t said, you know, it explains about its composition, I think that we can see from the entire shape and context of this story uh, that it is something which predates the entire conception of the history. Um, that we get unfolding for us chapter by chapter uh, in the Book of Lost Tales. Not that the Book of Lost Tales is quite as sort of contiguous as that, of course. Um, chapter by chapter is perhaps a, a slightly misleading way to put it. Um, but at least sort of story by story. They're more fragmented than chapters is what I mean. It's not like we get a, a, a sort of a continuous chronology um, among all of them. We're getting snippets. We're getting, we're getting snatches of story. Uh, as, but nevertheless, we're getting a larger, um, you know, one big story, which is being told to us uh, in numerous, um, in numerous chunks. Um, Michael Cheskowski asks, if this is the story is the beginning of Tolkien's Legendarium, why do we get so little of it in the Silmarillion? This is a really good question. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, but maybe we can come back and think about that a little bit more at the end, after we've thought about the whole thing and we see how this whole story works. Um, <laughs> Brianna says, because we can't have nice things. Yeah, well, no, Brianna, that's why he stopped the 1950s tour story, the one that's in Unfinished Tales, uh, and he didn't complete. Uh, that's, that's Brianna, the answer to that one, um, uh, why he didn't finish that. Um, which, and I agree, I, I, uh, I, I didn't used to think much of it, but boy, when I taught the tour story from Unfinished Tales in the Unfinished Tales class we did last year, I was blown away by it, you know, this past time through it. Um, 
it's uh, it really it really really struck me. And by the way, can I just say as a sort of a side effect, I am really grateful to you guys for voting these books in. Um, I have never done a really detailed study of the Book of Lost Tales before. It's you know books that I've read you know several times before, but I, I'd never really done a detailed study. And I am just enjoying the heck out of going through these stories in this kind of a detail. Um, I you know I feel like the the story of you know a tour in the Fall of Gondolin has really just kind of opened up things that I had never thought about at all before um and this stuff is really cool so uh, anyway thanks for the effort. thank you for giving me the excuse to go through and do this um uh now as i say from looking at this story as a whole i think we can get a pretty clear glimpse of what like the proto legendarium is i think well, i think that we're getting here is a real prehistoric layer. Um, now, by the way, the title for today's class, Before the Beginning of History, is a quote from The Hobbit. Um, uh, when Bilbo gets to Rivendell, and he is, we're, we're hearing about who Elrond is, and he's, and Bilbo is hearing about Gondolin, uh, you remember in chapter three. Um, and uh, he, he mentions it, and saying, you know, hearing stories from before the beginning of history. Um, and the fall of Gondolin is the thing that he's talking about, has happened before the beginning of history. And of course, uh, the, in context, that would appear to be, you know, local written history, right? Um, prehistorical in the sense of it, you know, predating human records, at least, you know, we humans don't have any records uh, of the fall of Gondolin or anything like that. Um, but, but anyway, I, you know, I, I, I like that phrase for today's class because, of course, in, in a sense, this is really before the beginning of Tolkien's own fictional history as well. Um, I, I mean, I do think that that's what we that that's what 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 we get here. Uh, let me do I, t for my first little piece that I just I had to throw out at the beginning. I couldn't wait until the end. I'm going to break one of my rules, which is to uh, give you a passage from part of this the the story I didn't ask you to read today. I only asked you to read the first half of the story up through the point where Meglin has done his betrayal. Uh, and uh, Idril has decided to, to carve the way out, but the battle hasn't happened yet. Um, but this is from the very end uh, of the story. Glory dwelt in that city of Gondolin of the Seven Names, and its ruin was the most dread of all the sacks of cities upon the face of earth. Nor Babylon, nor Ninwi, nor the towers of Trui, nor all the many takings of room that is greatest among men, saw such terror as fell that day upon Amon Gwarath in the kindred of the gnomes, and this is esteemed the worst work that Melko has yet thought of in the world. And of course, uh, I, I, you can skim right over those names, right? Uh, I mean, those names can just kind of um, uh, can just kind of, of roll right past you, uh, but of course, uh, then you look at the notes, at Christopher Tolkien's notes, and uh, and wow, Babylon, Nineveh, Troy, and Rome he's referring to here, right? These are like the gnomish versions uh, of their names. And that's really striking, isn't it? It's not quite as eye-popping as when, for instance, Bilbo refers to the Gobi Desert in the very initial manuscript draft of The Hobbit, in, 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 in the, the, the very first fragment manuscript we have um, of Tolkien writing chapter one of The Hobbit. Um, remember that part um, when uh, Bilbo says that he would, uh, you know, go to the east of east and fight the wild wereworms in the desert, you know, which so surprisingly showed up in quite unlikely guys in the film. Um, in the original manuscript, he says he would go to the Gobi Desert. Um, and, the, you know, anyway, that's kind of shocking, the idea of the way, how thoroughly Tolkien, in his very first thoughts there, um, was considering integrating references to real-world geography uh, in Middle-earth there. Now, uh, on the one hand, the f so, okay, that, that to me is sort of even more shocking than this, but this is still pretty eye-popping, right? And um, uh, on the one hand, of course, you know, we have to kind of back up from it for a second and say, okay, hang on, hang on now. Um, uh, this is not crazy for the Book of Lost Tales, right? I mean, at, at, at all points in his imaginative history, Tolkien was conceiving of this history of Middle-earth as, uh, as part of our real world, right? At no point um, 
I'm no, yeah, I'm quite sure that's true. At no point in Tolkien's life was the history of Middle Earth supposed to be completely separate from our history. So, why wouldn't the elves of Tall Erisea have heard of Babylon, Nineveh, Troy, and Rome? Of course they would, right? I mean, maybe they wouldn't care, but they would have heard, right? There's no reason to think that they wouldn't have heard. Um, so, you know, theoretically, it's and and then of course they're talking to Ariel, right? They're talking to a, to a man. Uh, so they, you know, it, it kind of seems reasonable, maybe, you know, that they're like, they want to put it in context for him, right? You've probably heard of, like, these other great cities, like, in your, like, little human history and stuff, but believe me, the fall of Gondolin of the Seven Names way trumps all of those things. Um, but, but there's no real precedent for this kind of thing. We don't get this kind of thing elsewhere, not in the first age stuff. Right, um, or at least that stuff, which later on will become the first age, even though it's the only age there is right now. Um, uh, so, anyway, it's um, it's pretty it's pretty striking, um, and this seems to be the rhetorical conclusion of the set piece story before we get back into the frame. I think anyway, um, and uh, in other words. It seems that this is really intended for another audience, not really intended for Ariel. It's been, you know, being transferred onto Ariel. Um, but again, it's it's one small piece that we get, which I think, um, uh, which I, you know, which I think gives us one little taste of the fact that we are imaginatively we're in a different place here in the Fall of Gondolin. This story is independent of his other stories in a way that. None of the none of the other stories are because it seems to be legitimately the first story. Um, so the only thing he has to contextualize it with are parallels in um, our world, in our history, and so that's what he does there at the end. Uh, even though you know he makes it sort of elvish. Um, Anyway, so I, I, that's just one one little small moment that I think really kind of points to this. But it's not it's not just that, right? I mean, notice we this is not. I mean, again, I I, I want to emphasize we're not just talking as we've been throughout in talking about the Book of Lost Tales. We're not just talking about an earlier version of the history, right? Um, it's not that it's just like you know an earlier concept which hasn't fully developed into the the full published Silmarillion version yet. Um, it's not that at all. You think of all the things that are absent from this, right? Not only is, you know, uh, you know, we get no reference to the Battle of Unnumbered Tears. Baron and Luthien and Turin both still had that, at least, right? Um, you know, the, the, the Battle of, of Unnumbered Tears is this crucial moment in the history of the, you know, the, the, the war against Melko as we get it in, in, uh, in the Book of Lost Tales. No evidence of that at all. Right. In fact, the entire conception of the sort of geopolitical situation around Gondolin um, doesn't even have room for that exactly. Um, not only do we not have any references, of course, to Baron and Luthien, um, but it it is uh, not even obvious that the Silmarils exist. Right. I mean, there's no reference to the Silmarils. Um, there's no. There's, there's not even a vague gesture towards the Silmarils. They're not even, there's, there's not even a consciousness of the existence of the Silmarils in this story. I don't know for sure. I mean, we know the Silmarils are a pretty old concept in Tolkien's mind. I mean, that he was in love with the idea of the Silmarils from pretty early on. But I don't see any clear evidence in this story that the Silmarils exist. Um, uh, and that's, again... You know, throughout this class, I've been you know been trying to kind of orient us, right? And, you know, and been trying to say like, don't don't just be continuously thinking of the later versions. Try to sort of see what these stories are and 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 try to accept them on their own terms. Accepting Gondolin on its own terms is even harder because we not only have to forget the published Silmarillion, in a sense, we have to forget the rest of the Lost Tales entirely. This story is a standalone story. Um, Look at the overall fabric of this story as we get it here, right? Um, Melko is ruling the world, right? He is the tyrant 
um, who is seems to have unquestioned sway over everything on this side of the sea. Uh, the 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 men are cooped up in the land of shadows. The the Noldoli are generally enslaved, right? The gnomes are generally enslaved. Some of them are wandering around, but they're still under the dominion of Melko, right? Um, uh, only Gondolin is free. Um, not because it's the last refuge and everything else has fallen. We have no sense of that history. This The geopolitical situation, as it's described, would appear to be static, right? This is the way things are. We've got the, the Ainur over in Valinor, but over here in Middle-earth, there's Melko, and he's ruling, and the land is covered with darkness, except in Gondolin, right? Gondolin is the one place where beauty, where an echo of the beauty of Valinor um, is. It's the, it's the one sort of correspondent there. Um, and Carita, exactly, I, I agree. It feels like a standalone fairy tale. Um, absolutely. Gondolin seems like a fairy kingdom more prototypically fairy kingdom than any other. I mean, even, you know, Artenor, of course, has a lot of fairy element in it, right? I mean, you know, that is that, that sense of that magical realm with its borders, which are, are hard even for, harder or impossible even for mortals to penetrate, right? And when, you inter, when you're there, you're under the sort of the magical influence of the, uh, you know, of, of, of the fairy queen who rules the, the wood. I mean, obviously there are some, you know, he's, we've got fairy tale elements going there too. The story, in the story of Gondolin, um, you know this story. The the harshness of the contrast between the gloomy uh, and uh, 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 you know oppressed world around it, and then that one city of refuge uh, is uh, uh, is is pretty striking. Uh, Michael, I'm glad you went here because it would. I, I wasn't going to talk about this much, but it would be remiss of us never to mention it. Michael Chevskowski says um, he wrote the first draft while he was fighting in World War One, right? Without getting too much into possible influences or illusions, what about this situation might have inspired Tolkien to write about this at all? Um, yes, yes. Uh, the Fall of Gondolin is famously a wartime story from Tolkien. Um, did he actually write it in the trenches, or did he write it when he ga- came back? It's it's not really certain. It's clear that he was thinking about it when he was in the trenches. Um, that seems relatively clear from the evidence that we have. Um, but anyway, so I mean, yeah, yeah, this is very very much a wartime thing for him. Um, so uh, a lot can be made of that connection. Much has been made of that connection. I'm resistant to a lot of what is made of that connection, I have to admit. Um, That is to say, it's not at all, of course, that I think that that's irrelevant, you know, that like this um, glorious battle story... Uh, and the most detailed description of military action that we get in like Tol- Tolkien's entire corpus, pretty much, comes when he's in the middle of wartime. Like that seems like you know not uh, really uh, a coincidence. Um, but the problem that I have, very broadly speaking, without getting into specific criticisms, the the the, the broad issue that I have is that a lot of people who want to talk about this can't resist like drawing some really specific parallels between what happens in the Battle of Gondolin and stuff that happened in Tolkien's experience in the war and I don't think it works um, I don't think it works as a reading of the story um, really um, and I don't find that a very helpful lens through which to read this story if you see what I mean um, that is, if you start looking at the fall of Gondolin as like for looking for like biographical evidence, you know, f- about Tolkien's actual experiences and his like concrete reflections on those specific instances and things, I think you're missing the point of the story almost immediately. Um, and what's more, I think you're missing the big thing about what's going on here. I mean, if there's anything, Michael, that I think we can take from it, that image seems rather striking, right? The, the idea that we have this gloomy, oppressed, you know, uh, tyrant-dominated Great Lands, right? Middle-earth, 
with only the one shining, uh, you know, city of hope, which is under siege. And ultimately, you know, the whole mood of that seems to me a kind of a World War One ish. I, I could imagine somebody in the trenches writing a story like that, right? Um, but the point I think is not about certainly, you know, not not about any kind of specific allegory, um, but just kind of the overall mood, as I said. Um, but, um, yeah, it, it, Lauren, it is escapism. Escapism in, in the good way, right? Escape, as Tolkien described it, and on fairy stories. That's exactly why I think uh, trying to do some of the kinds of parallels that some people do, I don't find, um, I don't really find convincing. Um, but, uh, anyway, yeah. Uh, interesting, Tom Hillman suggests, if it is relevant, it's the beginning and not the end. Um I can, I can, I can see that. Um, I mean, that seems a, seems a fair way to say it. Um, yeah, Michael says it seems odd, though, that he's writing a story that ends in the destruction of the good guys, right? Well, it, you know, in the sense that uh, if it's escapist, it doesn't it seems to be kind of depressing, right? Um, uh, yeah, yeah, certainly not escapist in the in the the sort of the pure sense, the you know the sort of pejorative sense, right, in which people use that term. Um, you know, the idea of like I'm going to create this like fantasy la la land to try to avoid reality. Uh, nobody really could make that accusation of the fall of Gondolin, right? Um, uh, but um, anyway, what we will think about this next week when we look at the battle and the actual fall of the city, but I shall not be drawn. Um, I want to stay, I want to keep our focus, on, but Mike, as I said, thank you for bringing that up, because I wasn't planning to talk about it, but it would be remiss of me not even to mention it. Um, uh, and perhaps we can come back and think about this more when we get to the end. But again, thinking about this story, the context of this story, the sort of overall frame of the story, not the Book of Lost Tales frame, because in a sense I want to forget the Book of Lost Tales frame, because I am not convinced that this story, um, I mean, it seems pretty clear that this story predates it, and has been merely, you know, sort of planted within this frame, and it works well enough there, I think, um, but I, that's not what I want to focus on, because I think it's not what we really, what we really, I, I, what what we really see, what we're getting is this is a one shot first age, right? This is the story unto itself. This is so when we think about this, I think that we're relatively safe in thinking of this as essentially the whole story of now. Now, I don't mean there's no more story than this. It's pretty clear that there are more stories to come, right? It's not the end of the whole first age story, but it is the beginning of them, right? So we're not, and this is so hard, right? Because we're used to reading the tour and fall of Gondolin. That's the second to last chapter of the published Silmarillion, right? At least of the Quenta, right? So we're used to thinking of the fall of Gondolin, not just as one chapter of the larger story, but a very late chapter of that longer story, right? And instead, this is the beginning. We get hints of the idea that things have happened in the past, but this is not just one uh, 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 thing in the sequence. Now, but, but we are going somewhere else, right? There is something to come. And in fact, this story is very interested uh, in at least one element of that which is to come. Um, uh, and that, of course, is Bright Eärendil. In these days came to pass the fulfillment of the time of the desire of the Valar and the hope of the Eldalje. For in great love Idril bore to Tuor a son, and he was called Eärendil. Now there too there are many interpretations, both among elves and men, but belike it was a name wrought of some secret tongue among the, the, the Gondothlim, and that has perished with them from the dwellings of the earth. Now this babe was of greatest beauty, his skin of a shining white, and his eyes of a blue surpassing that of the sky in southern lands, bluer than the sapphires of the raiment of Manwe, and the envy of Meglin was deep at his birth, but the joy of Turgon and all the people very great indeed. Um, now, uh, I, I, I've done a kind of an irresponsible thing here, of course, which I want to want to qualify right away. Uh, I obviously I indulged myself in a uh, biblical quotation there for my subtitle. 
Um, not because I am trying to suggest that A. Arendel is an allegorical representation of Jesus personally, but um, I very much intend to draw a parallel between the messianic tone of some of the traditional Old Testament messianic prophecies and the way that A. Arendel is talked about here. There is, I think, a very strong messianic sense. Um, you know, when A. Arendel is born, it's clear that this is the real culmination of the story. The message from Olmo is like a kind of pretense, right? we got to get this dude to Gondolin somehow, right? But the real point is the begetting of A. Arendel. Um, I mean, look at that. The fulfillment of the time of the desire of the Valar and the hope of the Eldalie. For in great love, Idril bore to Tuor a son, and he was called Eärendil. Did I say Turin? I meant Tuor. Anyway, um, oh no, sorry, sorry. sorry, Okay, sorry, I I was misreading you there. Um, Yeah, (laughs) Sarah was thinking that Tuor does a fairly good John the Baptist impression. Uh, Yeah, yeah, you know, I can can see that. You got the father-son thing there. Um, uh, uh, Yeah, but um, anyway, so again, I'm not trying to draw, I'm not trying to invite you to draw specific biblical parallels. I don't think there's even a significant parallel here between Eärendil and Jesus. Maybe, and maybe there would have been. Maybe he was going to go in that direction. I don't know. But that's not my point at all. My point is the significance of Eärendil is huge. Huge. I mean, it like when Eärendil comes into this story, he comes in with like trumpets and 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 a halo around his head. It is very clear when this hap- when, you know, in this moment, I mean, the rhetoric at this moment makes it to me so clear that this whole story has been a kind of a prologue to Eärendil, right? Um, and uh, and also, I mean, that seems to fit with what we um, know about the fact that you know the 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 verses about Bright A. Arendel, you know, the sort of the snatches of verses that, uh, that, that Tolkien wrote, that that was kind of the germ of the legendarium ideas. Um, so A. Arendel, and we'll talk about that, of course, when we look at the A. Arendel chapter in a few weeks. But, um, you know, so it's, you know, it's, it's fair enough to think that, uh, you know, A. Arendel was really at the root of this, so that he had those ideas. The story of the fall of Gondolin comes, and it is, in Tolkien's mind, presumably a precursor to the great A. Arendel story, that's supposed to be coming afterwards, um, but uh, but but this is really so. We'll come back to A. Arendel next time as well. But again, just I I I wanted to to to, to mention this as just another sort of context, um, another way, another kind of cue that we're given in how to understand this story. Um, this story doesn't have a long backstory. In a sense, this story is backstory. Of what's coming later, um, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, let's. Uh, I, I, I want to. I have a lot I want to get to, and I'm trying not to get behind. But doing okay so far by keeping you really long every night, uh, <laughs> but not falling too far behind so far. Uh, so I, I want to try to keep up my uh, um, my uh, my my good streak here. Um, so anyway, okay. Um, let's 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 look at Tor. Let's go now. Thinking about all this stuff and sort of this 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 broader context and what we're getting in this story, let's now go to the beginning of the story and look how this starts. And I think that we'll see sort of more of this unfolding as we go. Here's our introduction to Tor. Then said Little Heart, son of Bronwig, Know then that Tuor was a man who dwelt in very ancient days in that land of the north called Dor Loman, or the land of shadows, and of the Eldar the Noldoli know it best. Now the folk whence Tuor came wandered the forests and fells, and knew not and sang not of the sea. But Tuor dwelt not with them, and lived alone about that lake called Mithrim, now hunting in its woods, now making music beside its shores on his rugged harp of wood and the sinews of bears. Now many, hearing of the power of his rough songs, came from near and far to hearken to his harping, but Tuor left his singing and departed to lonely places. Here he learnt many strange things, and got knowledge of the wandering Noldoli, who taught him much of their speech and lore, but he was not fated to dwell for ever in those woods. 
Okay, so are you guys still getting uh, my audio? Okay, I noticed my picture was frozen there for a little bit. Did you? Are you? Are you getting my audio? Okay. Been having a couple internet issues here at my house the last couple days, so a little concerned about that. Okay, good, good. Um, okay, so where are we here? Um, what do you get um, from this opening? What kind of a story? Is this and what kind of a character is Tuor? What do we now notice? What we don't get, of course, right? Uh, his family, any history or context of his story, right? Uh, any larger plot of which he's a part. Um, he is off on his own, not because he is a descendant of anybody in particular, or because anything special was happening to his family or anything like that. He's just likes to be alone, you know? Karita, exactly. I mean, he's uh, he's wants to go and hang out and sing his own songs with his bare sinew harp, you know, and then, like, the, the you know, fans keep coming, and he's like, no no autographs, please, right? Um, he just wanders alone and talks to elves. James, that's a pretty good description of what he does, right? He wanders alone and talks to elves. That's the story of Tuar, right? Um... Doesn't he sound more like a... This sounds more like a fairy tale hero. Um, there is something sort of heroic about him, right? This uh, uh, this sort of strange loner. He's separated from the rest of, of, of his people, right? By choice, you know, because he likes being alone. But, um, but also, again, there's that sense of, uh, you know, he is... Um, uh, he's just different, Right, um, he doesn't quite fit in with everybody else. There's something sort of special about him, you know. I mean, he plays nicely and 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 makes a mean bear sinew harp. But, um, uh, b- but anyway, he's 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 uh, um, what's the phrase that um, um, Elrond uses about Bilbo? Not so alone and single as I'd thought. Uh, anyway, when he's complimenting Frodo. Anyway, um, anyone here, James was just thinking about Bilbo and Frodo, too. Um, yeah, possibly. Karina thinks he's more like a cowboy, uh, except without the cows or the horse or, or the gun. Uh, yeah, except for that, Karina. I think he's exactly... That's it's, it's, it's exactly right. Um, uh, now, so Nick is asking, who are the folk referred to here. Um, I, the folk whence to or came are clearly men. He, he, he's clearly a man, right? Now, Nick, it is tough, right? Because in these early stories, Tolkien uses words like folk and even men to describe everybody, right? Uh, men and elves and even orcs. Um, so um, it can be a little bit hard to, uh, uh, to, to, to get that together. But it's, he, he separates himself from the humans, and when he's alone wandering in the woods, he meets the wandering Noldoli and hangs out with them, and they teach him, and um, he learns a lot from them. Um, so not only do we get somebody who sounds like a fairy tale hero, right? Somebody who just like has this wandering fit on him, right? He, he, he lives alone for no particular and obvious reason, right? Nothing pushes him out into the wilderness. He just has this destiny upon him to go wandering, right? And he's a mortal who quickly goes and wandering among um, wandering among the fairies, wandering among the elves who live in the woods, and of whom we know very little in this story here. Um, and Mary Rose, I think you're right uh, that... It, I do also assume that he personally killed the bears whose sinews he uses to make his harp, um, which is, I like that Mary Rose calls it, says it sounds like a pretty hardcore alternative folk artist fairy tale guy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and that That is pretty hardcore, right? When you go and harvest your own bear sinews to make your harp. Um, but it also kind of sounds uh, very myth mythological hero-ish, right? That is not just like fairy... He's sounding less like Jack from Jack and the Beanstalk and more like um, uh, Achilles or or uh, maybe Heracles, right? Um, maybe King David, Sarah? Yeah, okay, I can get you. We got the harp and we got the bear. Yeah, yeah, okay, no, yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah, no. Um, but anyway, right, that, that um, you know, we, 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 got, we got all kinds of possibilities here, right? That sort of that sort of mode. Um, but again, there's no story here. There's no story yet. Just just a dude, 
wandering around. And then he gets to the sea. And here for a while he wandered till he came to the black cliffs by the sea and saw the ocean and its waves for the first time. And at that hour the sun sank beyond the rim of earth far out to sea. And he stood on the cliff top with outspread arms and his heart was filled with a longing very great indeed. Now some say that he was the first of men to reach the sea and look upon it and know the desire it brings. But I know not if they say well. In those regions he set up his abode, dwelling in a cove sheltered by great sable rocks, whose floor was of white sand, save when the high flood partly overspread it with blue water. Nor did foam or froth come there, save at times of the direst tempest. There long he sojourned alone, and roamed about the shore, or fared over the rocks at the ebb, marveling at the pools and the great weeds, the dripping caverns and the strange sea-fowl that he saw and came to know. But the rise and fall of the water, and the voice of the waves, was ever to him the greatest wonder, and ever did it seem a new and unimaginable thing. Um, yeah, Nancy, this story is really full of these kinds of descriptions, isn't it? The pacing of this story, especially at the beginning, is really remarkable. It's one of, again, it's one of the things that makes this feel like an origin story, doesn't it? I mean, that is to say, not a later chapter of a larger story. Um, you know, if this were like, and after the Battle of Unnumbered Tears, this happened, right? Um, we, we, we don't get these delicious descriptions. Um, we, this is, like, nothing in particular is happening yet, right? I mean, just, the mere finding of the sea, right? The opening of this vista, his marveling and wonder at the sea, the way in which we are having this wonder transmitted to us through this story, right? So far, this is just a story of discovery, right? Of the frontiers that this solitary man has discovered in his roamings, and this is a foretaste, right? A foretaste first of the marvels he's going to be discovering in Gondolin, right, when he crosses that final boundary, but of course also a foretaste of the messianic figure he is going to beget, right? Eärendil, of course, is going to be the first, just, he is the first man ever to see the sea. His son Eärendil is going to become the first man ever to sail upon the sea. Um, turns out the, uh, uh, the Argonauts were latecomers, actually. Um, but, uh, but yeah, Kate, good. Uh, Kate Neville says there's a sense that the whole world is new. Absolutely. I think that's a really great way to, uh, uh, to, to say it. Um, yeah, Jean says there's there's this uh, there's this almost innocent joy uh, in exploration. Yeah, and and the, the narrative pace, the narrative tone, really conveys that, right? I mean, this is not a story that's in any kind of a hurry. By the way, um, sort of footnote on that. I really wonder how long Tolkien spoke when he read this story. Because remember, uh, uh, Christopher Tolkien refers to this. This story was read aloud. Uh, to the uh, to, you know to that essay club uh, at Exeter College in Oxford uh, on that day when Tolkien shocked everybody when he was supposed to have written an essay and come in and read an essay to them and instead he read them the Fall of Gondolin um, and uh, Christopher Tolkien talks about how this version that he published here in the Book of Lost Tales is based on that revised version that Tolkien made in preparation for reading it uh, uh, to the to the essay club. Um, this is very long. <laughs> I mean, it takes about three hours uh, to read this whole thing aloud. I know because I listened to the audio version, and um, uh, I and I wonder, I wonder, did he actually read for three hours? Maybe he did. Um, I mean, you know, no TV, but um, uh, but anyway, uh, I, I I sort of wonder about. So, Gene, I'm just thinking about that in in relation to uh, this. Uh, you know this, this the, the that kind of uh, you know I want to say indulgence, but that makes it sound like it's a bad thing. Um, the free reign that you know Tolkien gives uh, to this that particular narrative impulse here. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, Jeannie, sorry, sorry about that. Uh, mispronouncing your name. Uh, good to know. Um, and. Uh, 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 good. It looks like you are connected with uh, Karita. Good to see more of uh, Karita's family joining her for nerd class here tonight. Um, anyway, okay, so let's carry on the uh, the adventures of Tuor here. Uh, finally, something actually happens to Tuor. 
One morning, while casting his eye along the shore, and it was then the latest of days of summer, Tuor saw three swans flying high and strong from the northward. Now these birds he had not before seen in these regions, and he took them for a sign, and said, Long has my heart been set on a journey far from here. Lo, now at length I will follow these swans. Behold, the swans dropped into the water of his cove, and there swimming thrice, thrice about, rose again, and winged slowly south along the coast, and Tuor, bearing his harp and spear, followed them. In the later version, right, Tuor follows swans, because he's got an appointment, right? He's got a destination, and he's got to get to Nevrast, and there's armor waiting for him, and Olmo's over there being like, tick tock, come on, you know, you got to get to Gondolin post haste, right? I mean, you know, Tour's got an, got an, got, got a, you know, he's, he's got an agenda, right? I mean, you know, he's got a, um, an itinerary. He doesn't know the whole itinerary, but he's got one in the later version, right? Not here. Here, there's this general sense, right, that he has something to do. Notice how this is kind of growing in Tuor's own heart, right? He's moved from that guy who just kind of likes to be alone, sitting by the lake, to the guy who has discovered the sea. Now to, long has my heart been set on a journey far from here, right? I have this sense that I'm supposed to go somewhere. Hey, I'll follow the swans, right? Maybe that's a good idea. Maybe I'm receiving some kind of vague guidance, right? But there's something kind of drawing me on these, on this, uh, in this direction. Um, uh, Carita, I think they're actual swans, not like magical angelic swans. Um, they seem to be, they seem to be real swans. Um, my, you know, is it, are they even an actual sign that is like, were these swans really sent to him? I don't know. It's never even really confirmed, is it? Uh, maybe I'm misremembering and there is something, a detail that I'm overlooking, but I don't even think we ever, act, I mean, we're not even told like, and then Olmo sent the swans, right? Um, again, in the later version, when he sees the swans, it's like, and he knew it for a sign that he had tarried over long, is what it says in the Silmarillion. Right? He's like, oh, oh, man, I really should get it. Move on. Right? Yeah, okay, okay. I, swans, I get it. Right? Thanks very much. Um, but that's um, that's not the sense that we get here. Um, yeah. Uh, Stephanie says, it seems that nature and the elements seem to draw him. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, uh, it's like he's getting pulled into this story. Right? He finds himself, you know, the hero of a fairy tale story, which he didn't embark on, you know, on purpose. He's sort of um, being drawn into this. Um, uh, Jenny, there does seem to be some significance, though it's not sure what it is. Um, he seems to read some significance in the fact that the sw three swans that then swim thrice about the pool. Um, that seems in his mind to make it sort of extra portentous in some way. Three being a significant number, generally, um, uh, you know, in much mythology and fairy tale. So, um, again, he seems to interpret it as a portent, and I take that as a, uh, um, as a, uh, as a, as an indication of one of the things that leads him to uh, attach any significance to the swans, but it's not at all clear what that significance is exactly. Um, uh, okay, so um, <laughs> yeah, Mary Rose says it's more like, "Hey, swans!" Um, yeah, it, it, it does seem more fanciful. I agree uh, than anything else, but. Um, before he, you know, he's uh, though he has this sense that he's being called to something. First, we spend a lot of time in the mill in the willow meads, right? Full spring had not yet brought summer when he came to a region yet more lovely. Here, the song of small birds shrilled about him with a music of loveliness, for there are no birds that sing like the songbirds of the land of willows. And to this region of wonder, he had now come love that sentence. And to this region of wonder he had now come. 
Here the river wound in wide curves with low banks through a great plain of the sweetest grass, and very long and green. Willows of untold age were about its borders, and its wide bosom was strewn with water-lily leaves, whose flowers were not yet in the earliness of the year. But beneath the willows the green, the green swords of the flag-lilies were drawn, and sedges stood, and reeds in embattled array. Now there dwelt in these dark places a spirit of whispers, and it whispered to Tuor at dusk, and he was loath to depart, and at morn for the glory of the unnumbered buttercups he was yet more loath, and he tarried. Here he saw the first butterflies, and was glad of the sight, and it is said that all butterflies and their kindred were born in the valley of the land of willows. Talk about origin stories. Then came the summer, and the time of moths, and the warm evenings, and Tuor wondered at the multitude of flies, at their buzzing, and the droning of the beetles, and the hum of bees, and to all these things he gave names of his own, and wove the names into new songs on his old harp, and these songs were softer than his singing of old. Um, isn't this kind of amazing? I mean, it is really beautiful. Uh, and, uh, James, this does sound like a very, a less malevolent old man willow. Um, it is very tempting to see, and perhaps he was recalling back to the land of willows, uh, when he, uh, depicted old man willow. Um, uh, it's, um, yeah, Karita says it's, it's beautiful, but it feels like a place where if you fall asleep, you might never wake up. Yeah. Yeah, the narrator says that it's enchanted and that many ha did not escape from it. I don't think that necessarily means it's malevolent, um, just that it's um, perilous, right? Um, not evil, but, uh, but perilous for mortals, I think. Um, The pacing here again. I just, I mean, how luxurious is this whole long description? Um, you know, and the multitude of flies and the buzzing and droning of the beetles and the hum of bees. Uh, but think about this for a minute. Think about how this fits into this overall story as sort of part of a fairy tale journey, right? He grew up in solitude, right, on the outskirts of the lands of men wanders further, discovers the sea, and is stirred by some larger calling, but he doesn't know what it is. Um, then passes into a, a magic land, right? A, a beautiful land, a, you know, a land beautiful beyond, you know, the experience of mortals, um, but a land so full of, of, of you know, the, the magical enchantment of its beauty that many a mortal has not escaped, right? Uh, and it's only by the intervention uh, of a divine power that he does escape and go on to do anything else, right? It sounds like, you know, a, well, perilous, if not dangerous, stage of his journey, right? Uh, on the way, this, again, it sounds like um, we kind of know where we are here, right? Um, but uh, at this point, Olmo takes a hand. Almo arises, not from the sea in wrath, but from the river in the middle of the Willowmeads. Oh, by the way, who remembers the Willowmeads? Right? The Willowmeads here, you know, this land of willows, um, maybe uh, Old Man Willow is a distant descendant of it, but there's somebody who remembers it. Exactly. Tom and Lauren and James. Treebeard remembers it. He sings his song about it. In the Willow Meads, that's what I was referring to in the subtitle. In the Willow Meads of Tasaranan, I walked in the spring. Um, if you want to revisit that spirit of the kind of luxury and indulgence of uh, the beauty of nature that we get in this description, Treebeard's with you, right? He remembers it, and that's what that poem is all about. Um, so, uh, not surprisingly... Treebeard remembers the things that were only described in the very, very first story in the Legendarium. Um, that seems like it makes sense. Um, anyway, but here comes Olmo. Then Olmo arose and spake to him, that is, you know, from the river, not from the coast, and spake to him, and for dread he came near to death, for the depth of the voice of Olmo is of the uttermost depth, even as deep as his eyes, which are the deepest of all things. 
and almost said, O Tuor of the lonely heart, I will not that thou dwell for ever in fair places of birds and flowers, nor would I lead thee through this pleasant land, but, th but that so it must be. But fare now on thy destined journey, and tarry not, for far from hence is thy weird set. Now must thou seek through the lands for the city of the folk called Gondothlim, or the dwellers in stone, and the Noldoli shall escort thee thither in secret for fear of the spies of Melko. Words I will set to your mouth there, and there you shall abide a while. Yet maybe thy life shall turn again to the mighty waters, and of a surety a child shall come of thee, than whom no man shall know more of the uttermost deeps, be it of the sea or the firmament of heaven. Whoa. Again, notice, like, um, the messianic, uh, you know, but one shall come after you, the latchet of whose shoes you are not worthy. Like, sorry, sorry. Um, I, 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 I won't go there. But, um, I, but, but, um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> focus. Sorry, 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 Tom. I lost. But we, we get the we get the messianic business there. Okay, Omo comes in and says, "Get moving, right?" And this is the first. You know, this is the the first time he is told. He had a sense that he was being called. He had some desire in his heart to go on this long journey far from there. Now he's told that he has this weird, this fate, this destiny, right? Um. And, yeah, Tour of the Lonely Heart. Isn't that a wonderful epithet, Nancy? Um, this wonderful description of it. And, and of course, it's, um, it's this wonderful kind of fate, right? Um, the irony of the fact that uh, Tour, Mr. Solitude, Mr. Stay Away from My, from my Fan Club, Mr. You know, I, I Can't Be Too Far Away from the Rest of civilization, his destiny is to find the city of the Gondothlim uh, and there to marry and to beget a son, right? So Tour of the Lonely Heart is going to uh, uh, to find his mate and to find uh, happiness. Um, uh, yeah, Arthur uh, prefers Magical Mystery Tour. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm sure you would, Arthur. Um, but, uh, but anyway, he's... He's got a destiny. He's a, now, so there is a job that he has to do. And Olmo arises. Okay, so his purpose has been revealed. Um, and we're shifting to the main focus now, right? The, the destiny of his, you know, the, the, the destination of his fairy tale journey, right? The city of the, find the folk called the, Gond the Gondothlim. And it seems like well within the fairy tale journey, right? The climax of the fairy tale journey, you're going to find the hidden land of fairy, right? Um, so off we go. Let's go to uh, let's go to Gondolin then, and look and look at Gondolin now. First, the context of Gondolin, right? Again, there are so many things we have to unlearn uh, here more than in any of these other stories because. I mean, yes, Turin is connected differently to the stories around it, and those stories are different, but at least it's connected to them, right? Um, here, it's uh, it's kind of shocking. So what's the what's up with Gondolin, and how do you get there? Well, okay, so let's... Veronwe, right? We, we get Veronwe. So Veronwe was there with Tuor from the beginning, but, but Veronwe has a very different story, right? But this Veronwe the Faithful came up with him again, and standing by his ear said, O Tuor, think not but that thou shalt again one day see thy desire. Arise now, and behold, I will not leave thee. I am not of the road learned of the Noldoli, being a craftsman, and maker of things made by hand of wood and of metal, and I joined not the band of escort till late. Yet of old have I heard whispers and sayings, set in secret amid the weariness of thraldom, concerning a city where Noldoli might be free, could they find the hidden way thereto? And we twain may, without a doubt, find the road to the city of stone. Where is that freedom of the Gondothlim? Know then that the Gondothlim were that kin of the Noldoli, who alone escaped Melko's power, when at the battle of unnumbered tears he slew and enslaved their folk, and wove spells about them, and caused them to dwell in the hells of iron, faring thence at his will, and bidding only. Right? 
we get the concept of the Battle of Unnumbered Tears, right? None of the political consequences, right? None of the none of the the the, the full details of that story. And I wonder, I wonder. I'll come back to this uh, in a second. Uh, let me put brackets around that for a second. Um, what's the point of Gondolin? What's the point of the Gondolflim? Um, they are the only ones of the Noldoli who are free. All of the Noldor, Noldoli, excuse me, all the gnomes are thralls of 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 of, of Melko and Voronwe. And so these escorts that uh, uh, that Olmo has whistled up to bring to or to Gond- well, the rest of them don't want to go, right? And they give up. And that's the context here. Voronwe, he's the faithful one who remains with him and says, "I will guide you." I don't know the way myself, but let's go. So we see his faithfulness and his courage. He, too, is being courageous not only in sticking with Tuor, but in defying Melko himself, right? He's going to make his own bid for freedom as well, and the two of them together uh, find exactly, Carita, the whispers of a city where you can escape from slavery, right? The city of refuge. Um, the one place where you can go and actually be free from the thraldom of Melko. Um, that is the role of Gondolin. Now, hang on, we'll come back to the Battle of Unnumbered Tears in a minute, because I have a question about that. But let's look at a couple other passages first. Um, <clears throat> there he heard concerning that city of Gondolin, and how unstaying labor through ages of years had not sufficed to its building and adornment, whereat folk travailed yet, of the delving, this, we're jumping ahead in the story, but bear with me here. Um, of the delving of that hidden tunnel, he heard, which the folk named the way of escape, and how there had been divided councils in that matter. Yet pity for the enthralled Noldoli had prevailed in the end to its making. Of the guard without ceasing, he was told that was held there in arms, and at likewise at certain low places in the encircling mountains, and how watchers dwelt ever vigilant on the highest peaks of that range, beside builded beacons ready for the fire. For never did that folk cease to look for an onslaught of the orcs, did their stronghold become known. Okay, okay. Um, uh, first, let me. Uh, Mark Ingram has a question. I have trouble understanding these wandering Noldoli. Are they escaped, or are they doing this in their spare time when they're not being thralls? Yeah, Mark, it is a little bit. Comp- it is a little bit uh, uh, strange. I agree because on the one hand they're all slaves, but on the other hand they do seem to be wandering around and have a lot of time on their hands. Right? Um, they're not. You know, the way that they're enslaved is through the spell that Melko has upon them, right? Um, they have been enchanted by Melko, and their wills change to his. To his. Um, notice how, remember the spell of bottomless dread um, that we've uh, heard about several times? You know, we heard about this in the Turin story, right? How, uh, you know, if when the spell of bottomless dread is on you, then, uh, you know, you become, uh, your will becomes enslaved to Melko. But notice how... Um, the first time that phrase is used in this story, it sounds like he's coining that phrase for the first time, right? And the spell that he put on them was one of bottomless dread, right? Whereas when we hear about it in the Turin story, it's a thing already, right? And But the spell of bottomless dread was upon them, right? You know, it's like that one, you know, that, 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 that particular spell. Um, it's got a label at that point, whereas this was really... Um, seems to be the time when that was coined. It's just like a, a way to describe the spell that Melko held over the Noldoli. Um, but um, but yeah, I mean, Nancy, I agree. It makes it kind of more scary, doesn't it? Uh, you know, like he's always... It's worse than having like a ball and chain attached to your ankle, right? You know, on the one hand, you're kind of free to wander about and do your own thing. But on the other hand, he's always there, right? Melko is like the ultimate big brother uh, state, uh, it, it's uh, so it's kind of uh, it's really kind of uh, kind of interesting, um, but but the way of escape. Notice this now. Um, the way of escape. There's there's a way of escape uh, in gondola in the later gondolin too, right? The way of escape is the only way out of the valley of Tumladen. It's it's the only way you can escape from the valley, right? I mean it's it's the it's and it gets blocked up when 
Turgon says, "Hey, we're gonna we're gonna stay home, right? We're not gonna come out ever again. So we're gonna block it up, right?" In the original version, the way of escape is not the way out; it's the way in, right? Um, it is the one gate that is left open so that people can come in, so as to enable the Noldoli who wish and who have the will to escape freedom, uh, slavery, can come through the way of escape and find freedom. Um, uh, it's um, it's amazing. At Karita, yeah, the spell falls from Bronwig when he reaches the city. Um, uh, he has found the way of escape. How does that work? I don't know. Um, Karita, you're right that it, it doesn't. It's it. It doesn't fall from Megwin when he comes back to the city, but I think we can see the difference there, right? Veronwe has come to Gondolin in order to escape from the will of Melko, and he does escape it, right? That is to say, his will is set against Melko, even though he is still entrapped by Melko's own will and by his spell. He's delivered when he gets to Gondolin. Meglin, eh, his will is not entirely set against uh, Melko. Uh, in fact, his will is uh, more or less in accord with it. So that seems to be that seems to be a pretty uh, a pretty major difference there. Um, okay, so Gondolin's role in the overall history here, right, is you know this in this this overall story that we get is pretty clear. It is the 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 the, the only hope, the only refuge. The place where freedom and light still lives, uh, freedom, light, and beauty, the home of freedom, light, and beauty, in the midst of uh, the thraldom that Melko has placed over the rest of the world. Um, and it's Gondolin of seven names. Let's look at the seven names, because we do get them all. Um, two are very sensibly asked. What be those names when he hears that there are seven names for Gondolin? And the chief of the guard made answer, "'Tis said and tis sung, Gondabar am I called, and Gondothlimbar, city of stone and city of the dwellers in stone, Gondolin, the stone of song, and Gwarestrin am I named, the tower of guard, Garthurian, or the secret place, for I am hidden from the eyes of Melko, but they who love me most greatly call me Loth, for like a flower am I, even Lothengriol, the flower that blooms on the plain. Yet, said he, in our daily speech, we speak and we name it mostly Gondolin. Uh, notice he seems to be reciting something which I am sure, uh, in his language, is in verse, right? Um, he shifts into the first tense, Gondobar am I called, right? Um, that has got to be a poem. Uh, in his language that he is citing, which speaks the seven names of Gondolin. Um, what do you notice here? What's the pattern? What do we learn about Gondolin from its seven names? And yeah, Nancy, it's a poem in which the city itself is the speaker. Isn't that cool? It's Gondolin's own poem about itself. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's pretty awesome. It's almost doesn't it almost make it sound like. Um, uh, Almost sound like a riddle, right? Uh, um, I, I I can't help but think of Sam's Oliphant poem, which adopts the same kind of first person uh, 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 tone, right? Um, uh, if you uh, if you'd ever met me, you wouldn't forget me. If you ever do, you won't think I'm true. Um, so it seems to be designed. I mean, of course, you know. I was about to say, it seems to be designed to sort of reveal the identity, the nature of the city. But, like, of course it does. It's its names, right? That's what, what names kind of do. Um, what do we see? What do we see here? City of Stone, City of the Dwellers in Stone, Stone of Song, Tower of Guard, The Secret Place, Loth, and Lothengriol. Those appear to be the seven names uh, of Gondolin. Michael is seeing a pattern. We, we, we have both fortress, right? Emphasis on its strength. Um, both city of stone and tower of guard seem to point to that, right? Um, 
city of the dwellers in stone, right? Uh, you know, there there are two which seem to be kind of internal echoes, right? Uh, city of stone and city of the dwellers in stone. Uh, does that really give us a lot more information, right? Just, just as like flower or flower that blooms on the plain, um, don't exactly seem to be like two completely separate names. Um, but um, uh, but anyway, we certainly get the the the, the strength of the city um, and its hiddenness. I like how the secret place is kind of the pivot there, right? Um, and the pivot between, you know, Tower of Guard and City of Stone and Flower, Flower that blooms in the plain, right? Um, so we get the loveliness of the city and also its strength and also its secrecy. These are clearly the central elements of the story of Gondolin. Um, and I, it's, it is both, right? It is both beautiful as a flower, but it is strong as stone. That's the paradox, that is the glory of Gondolin. Um, but we usually just call it Gondolin. Yeah, that is kind of kind of cool, uh, Sarah, isn't it? Um, now, when we get into Gondolin, there are these trees. On either side of the doors of the palace were two trees, one that bore blossom of gold and the other of silver. Nor did they ever fade, for they were shoots of old from the glorious trees of Valinor that lit those places before Melko and Gloomweaver withered them, and those trees the Gondothlim named Glingol and Bonsil. Okay, now, um, here we get something which really sounds like it refers to previous history, right? Something which doesn't sound like the origin story, which doesn't sound like the very first things. Now, uh, what do we do with this? Here's a question that I want to ask, and this is where I want to come back to the reference to the Battle of a Number of Tears earlier on. Is this original? Don't forget, the version of the story that we're getting in this book, um, Christopher says, is the revised version that Tolkien prepared for his recitation to the Essay Club much later, more than a decade later. After all of the unfinished tales, uh, the 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 Book of Lost Tales have been written, right? Um, he's already written and abandoned the Book of Lost Tales by the time he does the revisions that lead to this version. Um, I would love to have seen the original version, um, or even like uh, you know his mom's fair copy uh, of it. And I don't, and I wonder. Um, were any of these references added later on? We've spoken before, I've spoken many times before, about Tolkien's amazing skill in retcon, right? Um, do we have, you know, are any of these things things that are inserted later by him in order to work towards, I mean, when he has decided to include it in the Book of Lost Tales? Is he, uh, um, is he redoing any stuff in order to make it fit better with that? Um, Melko is dominant over everybody. Um, is the Battle of Unnumbered Tears native to this story? That reference to the Battle of Unnumbered Tears, is that native to this? Or is it step one of retcon, Right. Oh no! It's the Battle of Unnumbered Tears that explains why the Noldoli are all thralls and stuff. Um, maybe. And how about the trees? Um, Lauren, exactly. Lauren Falkenberg asks exactly the question: Were these trees named for the two trees in Valinor, or did the idea for those trees come from these trees? Um, I am not sure. Um, it could possibly... So what are so let's look at this passage for a second. Um, what are our two options? Our two options are, A, um, this is retcon, right? Um, the reference to the two trees of Valinor wasn't there in the original version of this story that he wrote, but he added it later when he, in, when he developed all that other stuff and integrated this into, the, into that story, right? That's one possibility. Um, and that seems simple enough. Again, that seems entirely in character. I could totally believe that. Um, second, what if it is original? How does that shape 
the context. Um, it gives... Okay, what do we get? What do we actually get from this, right? Let's be careful not to read too much of what we know about the other stories as they're going to develop into this, right? If it's original, what are we actually being told? Okay, we're told that um, these trees are shoots of the glorious trees of Valinor that lit those places. Okay, so there were trees of light in Valinor, and that these are shoots of those trees of light. Okay, um, so, so we know about Valinor. We've already had references to Valinor. Right? We know that Valinor is the place of the gods, and we're going to be talking about that more in a little bit when we get to delivering Olmo's message. So, um, so okay, so Valinor, Valinor is clearly a thing. Um, the glorious trees of Valinor, well, we don't really know that story. Oh, wait, except Melko and Gloomweaver apparently withered those trees. Okay, so that's something that seems to have happened. Um... There's some ancient tragedy, therefore, that lies back behind. Does that fit? How does that work? Is uh, uh, It does seem to me to fit. What do we see here? On the one hand, I get, if this is original, I could easily understand this. It seems to be a pre-echo of fallen Gondolin itself, right? Just as Gondolin is destined to fall, um, uh, so, you know, we, we, this is how it happens, right? There were glorious trees of light in Valinor, which were darkened and destroyed. That mythic concept seems to me not only uh, 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 logical, you know, so if Tolkien had come up with that mythic idea, um, even if this is not a later chapter in a contiguous story, the relevance of that mythic idea in the story of Gondolin seems pretty appropriate, right? Gloomweaver. Um, that's kind of an odd name. Um, that's not generally how uh, Ungoliant or Ungoliente was referred to in the Book of Lost Tales Part 1, right? Um, when we meet Ungoliant and we get the darkening of Valinor in the Lost Tales, um, you know, that creature has a, a proper name. Several of them, really. Gloomweaver is um, a little odd. I, not quite the same register as... Uh, in Unguiliante, you know, with Unguiliante, you know, with, with the actual name of the spider, we don't even know that it's a spider, though Weaver sort of suggests it. Um, here's the thing. I suspect that this reference is, a, is definitely original. Um, and the reason I think that is not because I think this gives us clear evidence of, like, earlier chapters of the story of which gone, but rather because it's an anticipation of a future chapter. Um, we'll talk about this later on. Um, Ethan, by the way, you're right. I, Ethan, I absolutely agree with you. Gloomweaver does sound something more like something from a fairy tale, uh, isn't it? But anyway, um, it's anticipation of a future chapter. We'll talk about this when we talk about the Arendel chapter, but Arendel was going to kill Ungoliant. It's one of the his things. Um, one of the, the the one of the foremost among the mighty deeds of that titanic figure Arendel, who is to come, is going to be the killing, uh, the slaying of Gloomweaver. Um, so that seems to be set up for what's going to be coming in later chapters. Um, Whereas its relationship to the past seems to be more that same kind of impulse for this that that perception of depth that Tolkien is so good at for his entire career, right? Um, the idea of the trees, I can certainly believe that the idea of the trees already existed in his mind that he had that concept as a sort of a mythic concept, um, and even and the darkening of them again it seems to fit. Um, maybe we should even come back to that when we talk about the end of this story and how it fits in with his whole sort of perspective, that is the perspective of the story, and where we end up at the end here. Um, but, um, yeah, exactly, Jeannie, thinking about the, the theme of hope and stuff. Um, yeah, it's thinking about hope and despair. Uh, that's where I want to come back to this uh, uh, later on. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and Alyssa says Gloomweaver is, is used uh, in... Book of Lost Tales 1. Yes, yes, I can believe. Of course, 
it would be if this predated it. It would be right. He would recall Gl- Gloomweaver uh, and maybe want to keep it. Uh, my point is that oh, referring to uh, to uh, uh, you know Unguiliante only as Gloomweaver and just using just that name, um, it it doesn't. It's it's different from the. T- overall tone. It's, it's, it's more of that fairy tale tone, as I say. Um, now, so, Battle of Unnumbered, that one reference to the Battle of Unnumbered Tears, is that the same kind of thing to it? Could well be, right? Again, it's very, it's that same kind of very general and fairy tale-ish kind of, I, that phrase uh, is, is one of, is one of those phrases that has a mythic power of its own, isn't it? The Battle of Unnumbered Tears. Um, even though, you know, the specific political context of the Battle of Unnumbered Tears doesn't seem to be there, um, you know, we, we don't, we don't, we don't really get that. I mean, again, let's go back to the, let's go back to the reference to it here. Um, where were we? Yeah, there it is. Um, know then that the Gondolflim were that kin of the Noldoli who alone escaped Melko's power when at the Battle of Unnumbered Tears he slew and enslaved their folk and wove spells about them and caused them to dwell in the Hells of Iron, faring thence at his will and bidding only. Okay, so you notice the only political context we get is the Noldoli become enslaved, right? This is why Melko is now ruling over everything. Because he won a battle. And it's called the Battle of Unnumbered Tears. That might be that might well be original too, right? But again, we don't have any of that context. It's none of you know none of that sense of like, and this is the next chapter after the chapter called the Battle of Unnumbered Tears. It's a look back at, you know, a, a reference to the idea. There was a time, of course, when the Noldoli weren't thralls of Milko, right? But then there was a big battle called the Battle of Unnumbered Tears, and now they really all are. Um, yeah, as Ethan says, we don't know any of the details about it, except to know that it's something unspeakably sad. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, uh, you know, again, I would I would love to see um, uh, to see the original version of the story um, and uh, and 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 just kind of confirm that all of the stuff is there. But I could believe it. I just am not 100 percent sure. So I wanted to kind of throw that out there. Um, anyway, let's uh, uh, let's get to Tuor and Turgon. Um, because this is the, well, apart from the hints we've already received that there's a messianic figure to beget, um, his message from Olmo is the big deal, right? He had this, you know, he's on this journey and he doesn't know why and he has this calling and he doesn't know what. Um, but then Olmo comes in and says, go and, but I'm not even going to tell you yet why you're going, right? Just go to Gondolin. And when you get there, you'll know what to do, Right. Words will be given to you there. Um, so this is very gradual revelation of Tuor's purpose, right? Um, I'm going to look at this scene in detail. Um, and here is where most of all, I think, in today's class, we're going to have to be on guard against importing later concepts of Tuor and Turgon, right? Um, later contexts to this conversation, right? Try to remember this in the context that we've been given in this story, this is all that we have, right? This is the entire story. Um, we've got a. There was a. There was. There was some battle of unnumbered tears, but we don't know what it was. Uh, there was. Uh, uh, there was. There's like Valinor and trees and stuff, but you know. But here we are in Gondolin, and now Olmo has a message for them. Uh, let's move forward to the message. Okay. Towards opening gambit here. Behold, the armed guardians of the gate pressed back the thronging folk that gathered about the wanderers, and one among them spake, saying, This is a city of watch and guard, Gondolin on Amon Gwarath, where all may be free who are of true heart. Ah, who are of true heart. Uh, See, there you go, Meglin. But none may be free to enter unknown. Tell me then your names. But Veronwe named himself Bronweg of the Gnomes. Come thither by the will of Olmo as guide to this son of men. And Tuor said, I am Tuor, son of Peleg, son of Indor, of the house of the Swan, of the sons of the men of the north who live far hence, and I fare hither by the will of Olmo of the outer oceans. Then all who listened grew silent, and his deep and rolling voice held them in amaze, for their own voices were fair as the plash of fountains. 
Then a saying arose among them, lead him before the king, <laughs> right? Then a saying arose among them, let's pass the buck on this one, <laughs> right? Let's kick this one right up the chain, shall we? Um, Tuor, son of Peleg, son of Indor, of the house of the swan, of the sons of the men of the north, uh, who live far hence. I'm the son of son of the men of the north who live far hence. Uh, notice how just mythological that sounds, right? You know, there's no specific families. I mean, he has a father and a grandfather, apparently, uh, though this is the first and last that we hear of them. Um, uh, of the house of the swan. Is he making that up? I mean, his house is going to be called the house of the swan. And he's going to take the swan as his emblem, the wing of the swan. Um, uh, I, I, I don't know if he's... Uh... See, Tom, that's what I don't know. Tom Hillman is saying maybe the house of the swan explains why he takes a swan as a token. I got the impression that, like, the three swans that led him off on this journey are what leads him to take the swan as a token. Um... And I'm not sure that he's that it's not going the other way around, that he's now, like, basically declaring his house the House of the Swan. Because, you know, like, as of, like, five, from for the last five minutes, it's been the House of the Swan. I don't know. Um, um, Karita, yes, elves do appear to have higher voice, voices than humans. We're going to come back to this, too, uh, in a few weeks when we look at the end of The Lost Tales. Um, notice, though... The several times in this story, in the Turin story, the references to the relative stature of elves and men. There seems to be a lot of, well, I won't say anxiety about that, but desire to clarify, right? He keeps emphasizing elves and men are really almost exactly the same stature at this point, right? Because that won't always be the case. But later, later. Hang on to that one. But they do seem to have higher voices. Yes, they do have higher voices. Um, so that's that's uh, that's cool. Um, yeah, exactly, Nancy. The elves are splashing fountains, but Tuor is the ocean. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, and Brian, yeah, um, I mean, had he seen swans? Well, like, probably by his lake he would have seen swans. Um, he didn't know gulls, right? Remember the sound of the gulls? He doesn't know what it is. Um, but, uh, and he thinks it's some fey thing. Uh, but swans he probably would have been familiar with. Um, but, um, but anyway, uh... Oh, right, Karita, it's, it's not that he isn't making, it's not that he's making it up, um... Uh, he's declaring it. That's not exactly the same as saying that he's making it up. Um, but, uh, but I don't know. Yes, Mar Mark, he did. You're right. He did. He had, he had a swan boat on his lake. Yeah. Maybe the swan thing was a thing. Maybe it predates it. Maybe it's just destiny. Maybe that's why he found the swan so portentous. He's like, hey, I'm the house of the swan. There are the swans. Maybe I should go with them. Uh, maybe. I mean, we don't know anything about Pelican Indoor, so I suppose it's possible. Um, but, uh, but anyway, even, even that, even just assuming that it was, that his house was well known and had been long established as the House of the Swan, though we haven't been informed about that till this hour, um, it, uh, and yeah, Michael, Huor is a distant, he's, he's, he's much later, right? We've got no, we've got nothing here. Right, um, no who or no prophecy to Turgon from no, you know, no prophecies about anybody but Arendel, basically, um, and um, uh, yeah, Yana, it, 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 Yana's pointing out Ulmo is putting words in his mouth at this point. Maybe he's making him declare that he is the house. His is the house of the swans. Yana, I agree. That's why I I came into this thinking that exactly, and and you've put your finger on what made me think that. Um, that it would be interesting to me if there were an element of prophecy in this. That is, if his house had not been called the House of the Swan until this moment, but it's declared that by Omo, basically, who is not declaring what has been in the past, but what is going to be in the future. So afterwards, Tours like, dude, okay, House of the Swan, I guess that's what I am. Um, that is why I was thinking that. But, you know, um, uh, 
there is that point about the swan boat. Maybe, you know, maybe he, uh, um, you know, as Mark points out, um, it's possible. It's possible that he really was from the House of the Swan. Um, but, um, anyway, okay, so, but it's really impressive, his introduction. Um, I have been sent, I am a, a, of the sons of the men of the north who live far hence, and I fare hither by the will of Olmo of the outer oceans. Okay, so there must be something really important going on here. Um, uh, uh, Brianna says it could be just a case of Tolkien changing his mind about things throughout the draft as he wrote. Always possible that he wanted to project the House of the Swan thing, but further back. Possible. Very possible. So let's get to the message. Now his mouth has been filled by the uh, Lord of Waters, and now let's see what he actually has to say. Torgan. Welcome, O man of the Land of Shadows. Lo, thy coming was set in our books of wisdom. Really? And it has been written that there would come to pass many great things in the home of the Gondothlim when so thou when so thou faredst hither. Okay, so there was a prophecy that he was going to come. Well that seems to fit, right? The whole destined journey thing and your weird lies far hence and all that, okay. So there was a prophecy and the Gondothlim had a prophecy of his coming. Okay, so that's interesting. So he doesn't get a fancy suit of armor, but he, you know, like in the later versions, but at least they kind of knew, they weren't totally shocked that he was coming. Then spake Tuor, and Olmo set power in his heart and majesty in his voice. Behold, O father of the city of stone, I am bidden by him who maketh deep music in the abyss, and who knoweth the mind of elves and men, to say unto thee that the days of release draw nigh. There have come to the ears of Olmo whispers of your dwelling, and your hill of vigilance against the evil of Melko, and he is glad. But his heart is wroth, and the hearts of the Valar are angered, who sit in the mountains of Valinor, and look upon the world from the peak of Teniquitil, seeing the sorrow of the seeing the sorrow of the thraldom of the Noldoli, and the wanderings of men. For Melko ringeth them in the land of shadows, beyond hills of iron. Therefore have I been brought by a secret way to bid you number your hosts and prepare for battle, for the time is ripe. Okay. Olmo says, Hey, um, the Valar over in Valinor, um, who look upon the world from the peak of Teniquitil, uh, you don't know what that is, but don't worry about it. That's where they are, and they're looking at the world, and they're mad because they have seen that... Notice the th- premise of this story is the pity of the Valar for the people of Middle-earth, right? Um, uh, put that in a Arendo context, right? Okay, so anyway, so, so Olmo says, um, okay, so... Uh, they have pity on on all you guys on the on the 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 Noldoli, you know, to, and you guys are doing great, you know, taking them in and stuff. But um, but we're done. We're sick of this. We're sick of watching Melko persecute everybody. Um, we're not taking it anymore. So it's time. The time is ripe. Go out and attack Melko and free everybody from slavery. Yeah, Tom. He does seem. Olmo does seem to have the Valar with him. Olmo does seem to... If he's taking something upon himself, he's taking upon himself the role of spokesperson, but he claims at least to be speaking um, for the rest of the Valar. Notice what else, though? There have come to the ears of Olmo whispers of your dwelling and your hill of vigilance against the evil of Melko, and he is glad. Olmo has heard rumors about the existence of Gondolin, right? Um, I mean, when I was reading this this last time, I expected that sentence to go in a different way. That is, um, um, the like whispers of your dwelling, your heel, uh, vig- vigilance. I, I think I'm, like, I misread that sentence um, this last time when I was misreading it, and I, and I thought it was saying that. Um, Whispers of your dwelling and your hill of vigilance have come to the ears of Melko, right? Which would make a lot more sense. But that's not 
what it says, right? The whispers have come to Olmo, um, down the river, presumably. I've heard of Gondolin. Isn't that interesting? Notice how limited the Valar appear to be. Um, they've only heard rumors. They don't know about Gondolin. They've just heard rumors about Gondolin. But they've come to send a message to the people of Gondolin. Attack, right? Go out and fight. Um, but exactly, James. Olmo doesn't even... Not only is Olmo not behind the founding of Gondolin, he doesn't even know about it. He's just like, oh, sweet, there's a city? Like, the elves have a secret city that's really strong and hidden from Melko? That's awesome, right? Let's, 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 uh, I'm going to send a messenger to them. Let's, and, and my message is, is, let's go, let's do this, attack, right? Because we're ready, man, right? We've got the posse, we're going to, we're going to come attack Melko, and that'll, that'll be great, right? Um, exactly, Yana, much less all-knowing, much less powerful. Um, but that, of course, must also be kept in context, right? So here's Turgon, king of the hidden city of Gondolin, right? Um, who's, you know, made this city of Gondolin quite laboriously, um, on his own, right, without any instruction from the Valar, and they're doing pretty well for themselves. And now here's this messenger from the Valar coming. His coming has been prophesied and everything, which is a point in his favor, but he comes and says, okay, march out and attack. The Valar totally have your backs. Uh-huh. Turgon's response is pretty quick, right? Then spake Turgon, that will I not do, though it be the words of Olmo and all the Valar. I will not adventure this, my people, against the terror of the orcs, nor imperil my city against the fire of Melko. Turgon's like, no, absolutely not. Forget about it. Um, Though it be the words of Olmo and all the Valar. Now, in the later Turin story, when the messengers from Olmo come to Nargothrond and say, cast down the stones of your pride, right? Cast Cast the bridge into the river. Um, and Turin says, like, yeah, whatever, right? Forget it, messengers of Olmo. You go tell Olmo I said, no thanks, right? We've got this, right? It's obviously a bad thing. I mean, it is stupid counsel from Turin from the beginning, and, and nowhere is Turin's pride and recklessness more obvious than when he turn, turns down the messengers of, 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 of Olmo. Of course, we were talking about how in the Lost Tales version, we don't get that scene. Right, that's one of the things that makes his time um, uh, with a, with the Rodolfum so different. But anyway, um, here it's not even like it is with later Turin because the Valar are much smaller. Right, um, this is like, hey, Omo, glad you finally got the memo about our existence. Right, but uh, thanks, but no thanks. Actually, right, um, you're gonna back me up. Oh, great. First of all, um, you know, how do I know this? Second of all, uh, is that going to really do any good? Um, uh, I will not adventure this, my people, against the terror of the orcs. The word adventure is a really important one there, right? To adventure something means to put something at hazard, right? To throw everything and not to know. It's not the same as the word venture. I will not venture my people, right? Um, I will not adventure them. I mean, I, I, I go out, I have no idea what's going to happen. Okay? Anything could happen. Um, that doesn't like sound like somebody who has implicit trust and infinite regard for the Valar, does it? Um, yeah, Tom says he seems motivated by fear rather than pride in his own works. Agreed. One could even say prudence, actually, right? Um, I mean, after all, he has not only an impregnable fortress, but a hidden impregnable fortress, right? Oh, yeah, let's march out in the field and meet him in the field. That sounds like a great idea. No, no, no. Let's abandon our strong point that we're in here and march out to meet him, Um, because that makes a lot of sense, right? you know, I mean, it's hard to, um, you know, I mean, the, the, you know, that will I not do, though it be the words of Olmo and all the Valar, sounds a little harsh, you know, and maybe uh, maybe a trifle less respectful 
uh, than could be. Um, but again, it's hard to um, really fault him, I think. Um, Sarah asks, how could uh, a tour be prophesied to go to Gondolin if the Valar didn't know that Gondolin existed? I don't know, but Sarah, it leads one to the question of uh, where did the prophecy come from, right? Uh, and I don't know where the prophecy came from. We never hear where the prophecy came from. Um, um, it just says, Thy coming was set in our books of wisdom. Um, so presumably it was prophesied by, you know, one of the Gondothlam, um who wrote the books of wisdom. Um, and we don't know where that prophecy came from, but presumably not the Valar. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, okay, so Tuar has a little rebuttal here. Then spake Tuar. Nay, if thou dost not now dare greatly, then will the orcs dwell forever, and possess in the end most of the mountains of the earth, and cease not to trouble both elves and men, even though by other means the Valar contrive hereafter to release the Noldoli. But if thou trust now to the Valar, though terrible the encounter, then shall the orcs fall, and Melko's power be minished to a little thing. What's Olmo's response? Trust me. Trust me. Yeah, I get you. I hear it sounds risky, right? If you dare greatly, it'll work out, right? Do this thing, which is risky, admittedly, but if you do it, if you dare this thing, which, notice, Olmo recognizes means trusting the Valar. If you trust now the Valar, though terrible the encounter, not going to pull any punches here, right? Got to admit, it's going to be awful. But if you do it and trust the Valar, then the orcs will fall and Melkor's power will be minished to a little thing. You will win. I promise. And the Valar will totally have your backs. Right? Okay. Okay. Um, now, again, notice. Notice how different... This is notice what a different world we are in from later versions, right? Again, this is the whole. This is the. This is the. You know, as I said at the beginning, this is the one shot first age, right? Uh, you know, so we've got this situation. There was a battle. It was a. It was a. It was a battle. It was a really sad battle in which the Noldoli had been completely conquered, and the men and the elves are all enslaved except for Gondolin. March out and go to victory. You can make this into a happy ending. Right, you've got. It's going to be risky. It's going to be a terrible battle, but you can march out and win. So this is not the futile. Notice this means that Melko is also smaller. The Valar is smaller. Melko is smaller. Right, he's conquerable. Um, Turgon could do this with the help of the Valar, but he could do this if he will do this. If he will risk it. Um, yes, Ethan almost seems almost to be supplicating. That's a really good observation. Um, this is not, hear now the decree of the Lord of Waters, right? That's not what we're getting here. Um, we're getting uh, prophecy from Olmo. He's predicting what will happen, but um, it's almost, it's much more like a negotiation here. Um, uh, but... Turgon said that he was king of Gondolin, and no will should force him against his counsel to imperil the dear labor of long ages gone. But Tuor said, for thus he was bidden by Olmo, who had feared the reluctance of Turgon. Then I am bidden to say, right, so this is Olmo's fallback position, right? Uh, Olmo was kind of guessing that Turgon was going to say no to the whole march out into battle thing, even though that was going to end well. That should be plan A, because it was going to be, but, you know, I, I, okay. Then I am bidden to say that men of the Gondolthwim repair swiftly and secretly down the river Syrian to the sea, and there build them boats, and go seek back to Valinor. Lo, the paths thereto are forgotten, and the highways faded from the world, and the seas and mountains are about it. Yet still dwell there the elves on the hill of Kor, and the gods sit in Valinor, though their mirth is minished for sorrow and fear of Melko, and they hide their land, and weave about it inaccessible magic, that no evil come to its shores. Yet still might thy messengers win there, and turn their hearts that they rise in wrath and smite Melko, and destroy the hells of iron that he has wrought beneath the mountains of darkness. I would be tempted to say, if I were to say, 
wait a second, I thought you said the Valar would have my back, right? And now you're saying I should go over and beg and maybe, maybe if I send messengers, they will turn their hearts and rise in wrath and smite Melko? But maybe, right? Oh, well, I'm glad I said no to plan A, right? Forget about that. Um, uh, yeah, Sarah, good. First, fr- that's an excellent preliminary observation here. Sarah King says, Turgon's refusal is more like rejecting counsel than breaking a commandment. Absolutely. Um, he, uh, that, 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 that does seem to be very much the context. Okay, so, so plan B. Plan B, run away and send messengers, um, yeah, Valinor is, like, pretty hidden and stuff, but, like, your messengers might get through. And when they get through, maybe the Valar will rise up and smite Melka by themselves, right? And things will turn out well, even though you didn't march to battle, you know, like you should do. I'm not going to say anything, but, um, you know, anyway, okay. Turgon's reply. Then said Turgon, Every year at the lifting of winter have messengers repaired swiftly and by stealth down the river that is called Syrian to the coasts of the Great Sea, and there builded them boats, whereto have swans and gulls been harnessed, or the strong wings of the wind, and these have sought back beyond the moon and sun to Valinor. But the paths thereto are forgotten, and the highways faded from the world, and the seas and mountains are about it, and they that sit within, in mirth, wreck little of the dread of Melko, or the sorrow of the world, but hide their land, and weave about it inaccessible magic, that no tidings of evil come ever to their ears. Nay, enough of my people have for years untold gone out to the wide waters never to return, but have perished in the deep places, or wander now lost in the shadows that have no paths, and at the coming of next year no more shall fare to the sea, but rather will we trust to ourselves and our city for the warding off of Milko, and therefore, and there too have the Valar been of scant help aforetime. Ouch! <laughs> Man, um, snap! Like, and thus is Omo full answered. Notice how Turgon is like spinning his words back to him, right? You know, I mean, there was Omo being all like, "Lo, the paths are forgotten, the highways faded, and stuff." Yet, um, there are still elves there, and um, you know, yeah, like they hide the land and weave about it, inaccessible magic and stuff. Um, yet, still, might thy messengers win there, right? And Turgon's like, yeah, yeah, all that stuff is true. And no, my messengers don't win there because we've been trying. For years, we've been trying. We've been sending messenger after messenger, and they don't even know. And by the way, you've just now heard whispers about our existence? Yeah, thanks for that. Way, way to pay attention, Olmo. I've been sending people down into your ocean for years and years and years, and nobody can get in. Plan B. Plan A was a foolish and reckless plan. Plan B is a stupid plan, Olmo. Right? Thanks for nothing, my friend. This is a remarkably different exchange. Turk, I'm not saying I'm 100% on Turgon's side, but his side is really defensible. Right? And his city is highly defensible, right? So really his plan is to say, actually, okay, marching out into battle is foolish. Sending messengers over to Valinor is Valinor is pointless. Um and he there's clearly some compassion for his messengers, right? That's what he emphasizes. Uh, you know, uh, here's almost saying like they're fencing out evil, right? And he's like, yeah, and they're also fencing out my people, who, as a consequence of all of this fencing, um, have uh, have uh, 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 perished in the deep places or wander now lost in the shadows that have no paths, right? So I don't want to hear it. So okay, we're not doing that. We're not going to go out and meet him on the field when we have a when if we're going to face Milko, we might as well face him right here, you know, behind the defenses that we've worked so long to build, uh, and uh, you know, and with our store of arrows that we could like shoot practically infinitely, uh, and all this and all this stuff. Um, so what do we make of this? How does this? very different exchange between Olmo and Turgon change the way that we view this story, change the whole context of the story of the fall of Gondolin. Well, 
for one, it seems to me almost entirely to remove the element of crime and punishment, right? Um, Turgan makes a, ser a very serious error in judgment, right? Sarah, as you said, he breaks a commandment later on, and he is punished for it, right? Um, and his the fall of his tower, mighty was the fall of the tower and mighty the fall of Turgon, right? Seems like a fitting kind of punishment, right? You chose to stay with the work of your own hands. You chose your city over, uh, you know, over obeying the commands of the Valar. You're going to go down with your city, right? Your city will be the death of you, and it is the death of Turgon. That's how it seems to happen there. That's not at all how it happens here. Um, yeah, he sounds like a good king who made a bad call, but for all the right reasons. Yeah, yeah, kind of like that. Tom says it's it's more tragic because there's fault on both sides. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Brian says it sound, sounds like uh, almost a little underprepared or underinformed about the state of Gondolin and what's really going on. Um, yeah, yeah, it does almost sound that way, doesn't it? Um, I guess I would say more broadly to that, Brian, the Valar themselves are more minor, right? They're much less powerful. Um, Olmo doesn't know what's been going on. Um, and this plan that he proposed seems to be not, in fact, a viable plan. Unbeknownst to him, not really a viable plan. It won't work. Um, and again, that seems to speak to the, to the very great and remarkable limitations of the Valar. Turgon's conclusion that Gondolin is on its own is defensible. It seems reasonable, quite reasonable, because he's been trying to appeal to the Valar, and it hasn't worked. Why should he march out of his gates? Again, remember, on the premise, I'm going to go out there, not because I think I can beat Melkor, but or Melko, excuse me. Not I've been doing so well up to this point. Um, not because I think that I can beat Melkor, but because you know, I've been assured that they're going to have my back, right, and fight with me if I go out there. Again, what kind of assurance does he really have? Um, is he going to do, um, is he going to be, uh, uh, is it really going to make any difference? Um, Sarah asks, did Turgon think that he could hold out forever? Um, well, exactly, Sarah, you just answered your own question. She then says, though if Melko is one of these Valar, maybe he could have. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Um, are we strong enough to go out and beat him in the field? No, but could we beat him if he, if, he, if he comes to attack us? Maybe, maybe, right? Better odds anyway, right? It's certainly, there's good reason to think, if, 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 if he doesn't think he's immune... Right again. Notice. Remember that element in the in, in the Silmarillion. That element that creeps in um, near the end of the Gondolin story, where Turgon and the people of Gondolin come to convince themselves that Gondolin is in is 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 you know invulnerable. Right. There's no way Melkor can ever possibly find us. Melkor can never defeat us, even if he could find us. We're completely 100 percent safe. Right. And then of course. They die, which everybody does when they think that way. But, uh, however, that doesn't seem to be the situation here, right? He's not just deluded about it. He has a pretty good estimate of the strength of his position. And it's not that he's saying, oh, nothing bad could possibly come if we stay here. No, you're being needlessly alarmist. But it does seem quite plausible to say, you know what? Maybe we will fall, but staying here is our best shot, Right? Of the three options, march out into the field, uh, retreat to the south and send desperate messengers on a hopeless quest to Valinor, or stay put behind our defenses, it's pretty clear which one of us, which one of them gives us the best option, right? We might be doomed in any case, but, you know, I'm putting my money on Gondolin that we've built. I can't say that that sounds like a stupid plan under the circumstances. Um, now, what do we see here? Now, who is it? Somebody, uh, Nancy, was pointing out, uh, Nancy Fosberg was pointing out that Valinor sounds a little bit like Gondolin. Yeah, notice the parallel again, right? Just as we got the Melko and Gloomweaver thing, right? This hint of the, a story about 
the light in Valinor being darkened uh, and, you know, sorrow coming there. Um, so too now we have this, uh, you know, this 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 additional parallel, right? And and that how that seemed to be. I was suggesting that that was a foreboding of what's going to be happening here in Gondolin with these two offshoot trees. Um, so too the walled fortress of Valinor and the walled fortress of Gondolin. That parallel also. Um, I, you know, once again we have you know, darkness sort of coming in. Is this just the theme? Is there just a kind of acceptance of this? That this is the kind of story that, he, you know, just Turgon realized that that's the kind of story that he's in, right? Um, uh, you know, that um, this is the way that things go, Eventually, evil comes in and conquers, and and light falls into shadow. So let's just stick with it as long as we can. Um, yeah, yeah. Brian points out further. Um, the tree business makes me think uh, that the elves could say, "Hey, look, the Valar couldn't even keep Melko out of their own heavily fortified land. Why should they? Uh, why should they help us keep him out of ours? Or how could they?" Yeah, exactly, Brian. Um, again. A question to be asked, right? Um, yeah, yeah, and Yana, I agree. We can see the foreshadowings of Turgon loving too well the works of his own hands, right? Um, uh, we can see that, right? Um, and, and I'm thinking here, especially in the previous passage. Um, no will should force him against his counsel to imperil the dear labor of long ages gone. Right there it is, Yana. Right there's our foreshadowing of the him loving too well, the, the works of his own hands. Um, but um, but it's just a foretaste, right? That does not seem to be what's activating uh, Turgon uh, here. Um Josh asks, ideally, are we supposed to know all this? You mean all this about, like, Valinor and, and the trees and everything? Uh, no, I mean, we don't know anything except what's in this story, right? But we are given, again, assuming we are given those references in this story, that seems to be the function of it, right? Not to um, allude to other parts of the story which are already in existence, but to contextualize the story of Gondolin within you know, with these other glimpses back at these other sort of mythic moments, right? The trees and the destruction of the trees. Um, the unknown battle of unnumbered tears. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so, he decides, no, but, but Tour, you're welcome to stay. If you want, and Tour, very understandably, does stay. Now, he's kind of inclined not to, right? At first, he doesn't want to stay. Remember, he's a loner, right? He's not really a city guy, Tour, right? But the king's daughter is really cute, so he stays, right? Um, and ceases to be Tour of the Lonely Heart uh, after this point. Um, I was going to talk about Meglin... But I think I'll, I'll save Meglin for next time. We'll talk about Meglin among the orcs and uh, Balrogs and dragons next time. Um, so we will we, we will watch the actual uh, catastrophe next time. Um, and uh, as I said, we'll talk about dragons. We'll talk about Balrogs. We'll talk about the orcs. Uh, we'll talk about Meglin and his betrayal. We'll look at the depiction of the battle. We'll look at the fall of. Uh, Turgon in his tower uh, and uh, will finally meet the glorious child um, whose face is radiant already. Um, so anyway, we'll, 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 we'll get to all these things next week. Um, and I promised we'll, we'll start with the bad guys so that I stop putting that off again. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining me. Isn't this fun? This story, I think, is so much fun. Um, I mean, just like the collapse of the only, uh, you know, the only beautiful, uh, lovely civilization there is in the world, so much more cheerful than last week, right? Um, 
<laughs> anyway, thanks everybody. Uh, we will uh, we'll try to finish this up next time. Good night. <laughs>